for a generation of YouTube fans, Mr. Beast has become an almost mythical figure. An ordinary guy creating extraordinary spectacles out of sometimes strangely ordinary topics, from counting to 100,000 to playing tag and hide and seek and all for eye-watering cash prizes. He's buried himself alive, recreated squid games and given away a desert island. He's known for giving those big prizes, cash, houses, cars and food to friends, strangers and as philanthropy. And he's built a channel with 90 million subscribers and doing so, earning around 54 million a year according to him. He started a nationwide burger chain, one of Jim's children, Joe Rogan, and plays over a hundred people. He's been at the forefront of some of the biggest philanthropic campaigns on YouTube. But Mr. Beast is part of a larger story. The story of American capitalism, corporate profits and politics. The story of American mythology. It's a story that takes some surprising turns. One in which a complacent media has neglected to follow the money. A story with a narrative that's been shaped, twisted and manipulated by corporations like Coca-Cola, monolith chemical and shipping companies, international meat monopolies, and the deep pockets of big oil. It's a shadowy story of injured workers, low wages, shady deals, collusion, pollution, bribery, and even suicides. What we can see through Mr. Beast is not speculation, but a perfect postmodern example of how capitalist mythology is manufactured, how it comes together and shapes all of our lives. So before we get to Mr. Beast's philanthropy, we have to do some important groundwork to make some progress in a rather new problem. We have to understand the roots of this much wider trend. Maybe the most worrying trend of our time. Because propaganda, lobbying, advertising, public relations, and ideological weapons used by big business have become so expertly proficient in obfuscation, run so deeply through back channels to avoid regulation, is so entangled in our culture with philanthropy, education, with the media, that big business can make perfect use out of an affable, generous, seemingly decent and well-meaning figure like Mr. Beast. What's interesting with prodigious figures like Mr. Beast is not how they manage to do what they do, but what they tell us about the culture that gave rise to them in the first place. What can Mr. Beast's success, his approach to business, philanthropy, YouTube and entertainment and sponsorship tell us? about American culture, capitalist culture, Western culture, and even more about ourselves. Every civilization has its myths. Rome had Romulus and Remus, ancient Greece had Zeus and Achilles, India had Dharma and Vishnu, the British Empire had great explorers and civilizers, and myths all had a function, purpose, and use in society. They all support a narrative about the culture that created them. What is America to me? Oh, I want to start with a quick story. Everyone's heard of David Crockett. Ordinary Richmond, the wild king of frontiersman, the self made hero of the American West. He was running well across the country in plays and short stories, and his life in the world to make it his adventures. When the French writer had access to top four toys around him and the way the books of evolution to try to understand what was distinctive about American life, he noted, Two years ago, the inhabitants of the district which Memphis is the capital sent a house of representatives in Congress and individual men, David Trump. He was in the education, and he was in the business, and he was in the 
and then I tip pizza delivery people 100 bucks and then I tipped the homeless man 10 grand and then you know gave away cars gave away houses and last hand take take hand off million dollars keeps it basically the entire time so like the last like eight or nine years like every dollar I've made I just spent it the next month in content and I just did that every single month and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and here we are <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
far better than it could or would have done itself. The wealthy paternalist could dispense with their wealth in a responsible way, building libels while discouraging, quote, the slothful, the drunken, the unworthy. And while Kanji was building libels and donating to churches and universities on the one hand, he was ruthlessly expanding, paying politicians bribes, and subjecting his employers to grim working conditions and paying them to justify the poverty. One workday said that they don't notice any old men. The long illness, the strain, the sudden changes of temperature and views a man up. Sociologist John A. Fitch said that the conditions led to old age at 40. Workers work seven days a week, 12 hours a day, with just one holiday, the 4th of July. And Carnegie's philanthropic attack came after one of the most brutal labour disputes in American history. workers were striking at Homestead in Pennsylvania in response to a pay cut. The battle broke out between Carnegie's men and the striking workers, and eventually 8,000 National Guardsmen were sent in to quell the strike. At least 10 men were killed in the fighting. After the strike was over, Carnegie was sent a telegram by his chairman, Henry Ford. Victory itself. Carnegie replies, Cables received. First happy morning since July. Congratulate all around. And Frick then responded with, Our victory is now complete and most gratifying. Do not think we will have any serious labour trouble again. But Homestead had turned the public against Carnegie, and later, in a letter, he complained that, quote, the mass of public sentiment is not with us about Homestead on the direct issue of readjustment of the wage scale. People did not understand it, but I observed that the opinion was greatly impressed by the few acts of kindness. Carnegie knew that there was more than one way to tip the balance of public opinion, and he knew how important public opinion was for the business. So while his philanthropic efforts ramped up in the following years, it did so at the expense of his some 40,000 workers. Historians have shown that while the value of Carnegie's goods more than doubled over the years following the strike, the wages of his men were cut by 67%. Carnegie had discovered that when it came to profits, public opinion was as important as bribery and wage cuts. And he's probably the most notable example of a trend that became known as well. During the same time, the very John B. was also given the work to large sums while simultaneously crushing the work of strikes. In 1914, strikers at Ludwig were thrown down by the National Guard. At least 25 died, including women and children. Rockefeller congratulated the National Guard for, quote, fighting the good fight which is not only in the interests of your own company, but of other companies in Colorado, and the business interests of the entire country, and labouring classes quite as much. Rockefeller threatened his competitors and chaired secret meetings to monopolise the market and drive up prices. Corporations like Rockefeller's Standard Oil and Carnegie Steel became so powerful that in 1890 Congress passed an antitrust act to weaken the robber barons and break up their monopolies, prohibiting anti-competitive practices, including artificially raising prices. Senator John Sherman, who the act was named after, said that if we will not endure a king as a political power, we should not endure a king over the production, transportation and sale of any of the necessaries of life. 
from an inquiry of the lawyer from Rolf said that it's been stated many times that it might be better for people controlling very large industries instead of devoting the excess profits to the dispensation of money along philanthropic lines that they should organise some system by which they could distribute it in wages first or give to the workers a greater share of the productivity of industry in the first place. In 1911, the Supreme Court split Rockefeller Standard Oil into 36 smaller companies, including Exxon, Mobil, and Chevron. Today, we all know that PR and image is as important as reality. Most senior public figures curate a kind of mythical figure around themselves, and we can see this phenomenon everywhere. Dominoes, for example, recently donated $100,000 to small businesses in a support local campaign, but then spent roughly a million dollars in a marketing campaign, making sure that everyone knew about it. And recently, Volkswagen has championed their philanthropic donations for a variety of cruises, including beach preservation, while simultaneously designing low-emission vehicles that will risk the cheap emissions tax. This phenomenon is so widespread, it's difficult to choose which examples to pick. And even more worry, many of these philanthropic contributions end up running through foundations like the Gates Foundation, which, to scholars like sociologist Lindsay McGill and Professor Emil Gary Jenkins, have a in this logic of charity in exchange for influence and good PR. McGreevy argues that the Gates Foundation is paternalistic, ignores Bounty's concerns about their approach, focuses too much on vanity projects, and often favours reducing regulations in developing countries. Furthermore, McGreevy writes that study after study has proven that only a small percentage of charitable donations from wealthy donors reach poor individuals. Most of it tends to go to Aminati, or cultural institutions frequented by the wealthy. The rich also gives less of their incomes proportionately than the poor do. In fact, the number of private charitable foundations have skyrocketed in recent years. About 5,000 are set up every year, despite charitable giving in the US being steady at about 2% of GDP. What explains it? Well, as inequality increases and wages stagnate and billionaires amass pools of wealth so vast that would make Carnegie and Rockefeller's eyes water, what better way to spend money than on PR and influence that avoids regulation? It's not as crass and transparent as traditional advertising and tons of capital. In this context, White washing, green washing, pink washing are everywhere. Take this starting point. One study in 2012 found that the seven percent of donation root causes that could be defined as a benefit to the Another study found that 55% of doctors went to large organizations with budgets over $5 million already. In other words, most donations go to religions or cultural foundations like churches, institutions, museums, and galleries, which are much more widely and frequented by the wealthy associates and the wealthy and, let's face it, wiser donors who might be trying to act under some modern artists, but are a bit less likely to help individuals who probably just need a few decent meals and some better roads. The French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu proved the participation in this kind of activity, the accumulation of symbolic capital, that was 
good group not practicing to support the institutions that value public prestige, power and influence. And this trend over the last few decades has coincided with the loosening of regulation, the rolling back of labour, and some of the decline of our good standards, and the increase in inequality across the world. As Carl Rose in front of you, example, what we are witnessing is the transfer of responsibility for public goods and services from the very class of the institution to the right to be administered by an executive. All of this begs an important question. Why is the line between philanthropy and self-interest, between doing good and looking good? What happens when philanthropy becomes destructive or destructive? giving turkey on their table for that special holiday. She continues, no matter what their gathering size is, Genio is going to be helping provide turkeys for families and then they just have to bring the sides and really enjoy Thanksgiving all together. Comments from articles like these and the articles themselves have been syndicated across the web by outlets like The Independent, Yahoo News and US News. 
So, other than the obvious publicity, what motivation could Jenny O have for publicly giving away free turkeys every year? Well, Jenny O is owned by Hormel Foods, a huge conglomerate which owns over 40 brands including Jenny O, Spam, Applegate and Skippy Peanut Butter. Conglomerates like Hormel, Nestle, PepsiCo and, as we'll see in a second, Smithfield dominate the market in the US and much of the rest of the world. In 2021, Hormel, Jenny O's parents and Smithfield, who Mr. Beast has also worked with in this Eating America video, were both accused of being involved in an illegal price fixing scheme to inflate the prices of pork and increase their profits. These two companies, Hormel and Smithfield, along with two others, Tyson and JBS, control 80% of the meat markets in the United States. The lawsuit accused the suppliers of trying to, quote, fix, raise, stabilize and maintain artificially inflated prices for pork sold in the United States since 2009. In 2021, Smithfield, whose Chinese owner, WH Group, is the world's largest supplier of pork, settled, paying $33 million in fines. And there's been an increase in the discovery of similar price-fixing schemes in big meat in recent years. In 2021, Tyson Foods and Pilgrim's Pride were fined $221 million and $108 million, respectively, for doing the same thing in the poultry industry. And seafood giant Bumblebee Food CEO Chris Lischewinski was sentenced to 14 months in prison in 2020 for price fixing in the tuna industry. Is it a coincidence that the same people who are affected by price fixing schemes that satisfy rich CEOs and shareholders but drive up the price of everyday essentials are the same people? who need to come to a food drive to get handouts at Thanksgiving. In 2021, The Guardian investigated the effect these huge food monopolies have on our economies and societies. Nina Lakhiani, Alia Utiova, and Alvin Chang write that a handful of powerful companies control the majority market share of almost 80% of dozens of grocery items bought regularly by ordinary Americans. These conglomerates have been growing in power since the 80s as regulations have been weakened, mergers and acquisitions have been encouraged to cut costs and lobbying of politicians has increased, while at the same time half of the least well-paid jobs are in the food industry. The conditions are getting worse too. One study in 2013 found that 42% of poultry workers had some evidence of carpal tunnel. One former worker at Chicken Quick said that there are so many injustices there. Sometimes you get really dizzy from how fast the line speed went, but we're not allowed to say we're not going to work at this speed. We're not asking you, they're telling you how to do it. Jenny went on strike when one claimed she wasn't offered medical attention and was fired after a hand got stuck in a machine she was never trained to work on in the first place. Debbie Berkowitz of the National Employment Law Project said that the meatpacking industry is much more dangerous now than in the 90s and the biggest factors are consolidation and cutting corners of work and safety. And Amanda Starbuck policy analyst that Food and Water Watch told The Guardian that it's a system designed to throw money into the hands of corporate shareholders and executives while exploiting farmers and workers and deceiving consumers by choice, abundance and efficiency. So remember, Jenny spent a quarter of a million dollars on this video with Mr. Beast. The previous year, during the 2020 election cycle, the food industry spent $175 million on lobbying and political contributions, 
two-thirds went to Republicans who want to roll back regulations even further. And to understand how much of an effect this has and how popular it has become with the industry, it's worth noting that the figure was in 1999 and 1992. These programs dominate our shelves and our politics while driving out competition and inflating prices. Genio's parents, or now food profits, have skyrocketed in recent years, while the price farmers get paid for meat has declined at the same time. Across the world, while food conglomerates do well, farmers are struggling financially, getting into debt and facing a mental health crisis. The same report in The Guardian writes, advocates say that the toxic climate chaos and trade wars contributed to a mental health crisis in the farmers. Farmers are one of the most likely groups to take their own lives in countries including the US, Australia, UK and India. In the West alone, 450 farmers committed suicide between just 2014 and 2018. In the UK, farmer takes their life every week.
host Nero Bang and large sugary drinks, arguing for the move with a disproportionately affect minorities. Coca-Cola and Pepsi co founded many five public health organisations between 2011 and 2015. Nothing the influence of the nation's health on the organisations is explicit. The Associated Press discovered leaked Coca-Cola emails that revealed they were directly involved in shaping policy at anti-obesity group GBN after they received a $1.5 million donation. Coca-Cola's chief health and science officer was involved in advising on the content of the website, editing the mission statement, and even choosing the senior staff.
when philanthropy is commercialized in this way, it has to drain it of important questions, conceal any unfavorable elements, and draw out the feel-good factor. Should these things really make us feel good, though? Or should they make us feel guilty, lazy, spur us into action rather than provide escapism? What happens when a story that meets the limelight is not a feel-good story? What happens if it's depressing, violent, difficult? When corporations are motivated by profit to support philanthropic causes that only align with their motives, and then partner with the media in a way that anesthetizes the problem to make everyone feel better, then, of course, the more difficult, boring, academic, less well-funded solutions will get crowded out. Who wants to read about plastic pollution when they can go and watch a Mr. Beast video? Which leads us to the second phenomenon that ties this narrative together, what I'll call the Big Man Affair. The new philanthropists, from Carnegie and Rockefeller to Clinton, Mr. Beast and Coca-Cola and Genio, lead us to an important question that I mentioned earlier. Where's the line between altruism and self-interest? And does it matter? In the 1960s, an anthropologist studying tribes in Papua New Guinea discovered a phrase the tribes people had, the big man. They found that tribe leaders had become well known and respected for one skill in particular, giving gifts. This gift giving created a unique type of economy, one where who gave gifts to whom and when acted as a type of exchange for reputation and power. The aim of the big man, the anthropologist Chris Gregory reported, is to acquire a large body of people, gift debtors, who are obligated to him. Another anthropologist, Marcel Max, looked at these studies in his influential essay, The Gift. He argued that giving gifts was sometimes a type of power. It increased the gift giver's prestige. The absolutist ruler of France, King Louis XIV, known for his extravagant palace and spending, was also a generous supporter of the arts. One of his contemporaries wrote to Louis that let him who wants, or rather who will be able to do so in a worthy fashion, speak of the wisdom of this great king who provided the life of grace to so many souls by this holy zeal, his patience, his gentleness, his gifts, by laws as salutary as they are just. Louis created a cult of personality, becoming known as the Sun King, the centre of France's universe. He commissioned busts of himself from portraits and supported ballet and theatre and music that ultimately functioned as well as royal propaganda. Louis knew that in the eyes of the public, more than anything, it was important how one looked. His gifts, like the leaders of tribes in Papua New Guinea, established prestige. His people were his children, looked after by a benevolent benefactor. Oscar Wilde wrote a famous essay critiquing charity, saying that it was really about prestige. He complained about how the so-called benevolence of wealthy Victorian industrialists was a means to compensate for their harsh labour practices. He wrote that the best among the poor are never grateful. They are ungrateful, discontented, disobedient and rebellious. They are quite right to be so. Why should they be grateful for the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table? They should be seated at the board and are beginning to know it. And the French poet Baudelaire saw through this too. In a short story about a man giving a counterfeit coin to a beggar, he wrote that his aim had been to do a good deed while at the same time making a good deal. To earn 40 cents and the heart of God, to win paradise economically, in short, to pick up gratis the certificate of a charitable man. The 
French philosopher Jacques Derrida also saw gifts were full of double meanings. They can be one thing, they can be selfless, but they can be self-interested, calculated, even poisonous, double-edged. Does this mean we should always look at Mr. Beast videos like this cynic? It's always motivated by profit and self-interest? Not necessarily. As Derrida we have multiple, overlapping, sometimes contradictory motivations in fact. But we should always try and demystify what those motivations are and what the results of living are. Mr. Beast is not solving a homelessness problem. Homelessness will never be solved in this way. In fact, what's commercialized in videos like this is our fascination with just how unlikely this is to happen. Of course we can't help but we click on a video like this. Of course we're all curious because it's such a singular event, such a one-off, so astronomically improbable that we just have to see the reaction. But when it comes to widespread structural and social issues like pollution, homelessness, poverty, hunger, philanthropy like this doesn't cut it. The gifts from quarter to a web of PR, misdirection, whitewashing, have the same effect as placing a little band-aid over a cut, just enough to mask it. Just enough to boost image, to make everyone involved look good, without ever addressing the underlying problem. In the German ideology, Karl Marx wrote that the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch. Thank you. 
but the ethics of helping others, the difficult work of addressing hard problems, and the dry deliberation and research of politics and political issues cannot be reduced to an exchange for entertainment. Morality does not arise from a positive sum of exchange. I don't give the homeless man a penny and expect a little gig in return. Philanthropy is difficult, but usually comes at a cost in time and effort and money and resources. And if everything gets turned into a market for exchange, a commercial venture, motivated by profit and material reward, then what happens to the issues and areas and people and ideas that aren't polished and content workers? When you uncritically leave philanthropy in the hands of a big tech logo, a YouTube personality, a foil band, or a film, we get shiny robots and pools of mirrors, we get the food band in the sea, we get the distraction, we get the spectacle, we get entertainment, we get empty libraries and more food banks and lower wages, we get whitewashing, greenwashing, pinkwashing, bonewashing, and Thank you as always for watching and a huge thanks of course as always to my Patreon without which this just wouldn't be possible. So if you want to see scripts, if you want to chat in the Discord server, if you want your name in the credits, but most of all if you just want to help us or make this content, then click the link in the description below. If not, you can like, you can share, you can leave a comment, all those things that help the algorithm. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Yes.
experience uh, or uh, anything like that. I'm just sort of in that blob. Nice. Uh, on Twitter a lot, I, I would assume. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so what inspired you to start Chapo all the time in 2016? How did you come up with the name? Oh, that was Will's idea. I mean, he just said it sort of as a joke at the end of our first broadcast that was a, a test run. We just recorded ourselves on a Google Hangout. Uh, we didn't know how to edit it. We just did a Google Hangout on YouTube with the audio. Right. Sent that out there just really to see if people thought it was good, thought it was interesting. Uh, and we got a really strong response, so we've been doing it. The name was not something that any of us really thought of. Will threw it out there again to go. He was into hip hop. And uh, then, you know, once it kind of immediately got a response, followed up and just more, it, it was stuck. Uh, we, we, we haven't really, we haven't had, you know, it's been at times embarrassing. I know a lot of people sometimes get offended by it, but it's appropriate. Uh, but, you know, we, we, part of the reason the show, I think, worked is that none of us really were thinking too hardly about what we were doing. Uh, and so it was able to have sort of an uh, authentic and fresh feeling for people. And that was part of the reason. Yeah, it definitely was like Chopper Crown much better than uh, any generic politics show that you came up with. Yeah, yeah, like just like the politics boys you can see. Not a bit of a good idea. So, if you have Tiberius kind of sworn out to the world, but are the critics of the world in the world? Which would be the most of these threats? I don't remember really. I'm thinking about it. We were mostly just kind of yelling about it. Thank you. 
but this is Tyrant with uh, out of uh, 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 I think I did for the personality for myself and I was just grounded in uh, the reality of life. Uh, and because this is the, the Siren Fall of the Kate that are very, very just uh, seductive and clearing out out of control and degrading uh, yeah, but I know that people in the country are very interesting. And we're going to be able to get the best of 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 the best
makes great inroads with a lot of former Democratic voters uh, in the South and the white flight suburbs of the Reagan Democrats. Uh, and then, but you still don't have a real... That really doesn't hit like, levels of Congress until 1994 uh, presidential election. And you know, Bill Clinton still wins in West Virginia with uh, his election scandal. Uh, and it was really the 2000 election year. Thank you. 
spot on fire. <laughs> spot the last cycle. Uh, so, social media is the last cycle. Maybe those are the longest subjects. In the same way, you can
if you stare in your head So I won't stop you into the shower heads Waffles stop you into the shower head 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 Waffle stuff into the shower head. 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 Thank <laughs> you.